Hello, and welcome to Austin Opera's Live from Indie Terrace weekly broadcast. I'm Nathan DePoint, Senior Director of Artistic Operations, and it is our pleasure to spend the month of March celebrating Women's History Month by highlighting several talented women that we've had the pleasure to work with over the years. This week's guest is the brilliant and wonderful Tara Faircloth. Tara is a highly sought after stage director who was most recently with us on Rigoletto to kick off our 2019-2020 season. Tara has frequented some of the country's most prestigious opera houses, Houston Grand Opera, the Lyric Opera of Chicago, and Atlanta Opera, to name a few. She's equally well known for her work on the legacy repertoire, as well as new and Baroque opera. Please welcome Tara Faircloth to our episode. Hi. Hey, Tara. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm fantastic. Where where do we where do we uh, find ourselves catching up with you now? Uh, well, you find me strangely enough, in beautiful, sunny Austin, Texas. <laughs> this is my uh, COVID quarantine period time here. Okay, okay. Um, and so you survived the storm a couple weeks ago. I did survive the storm. Yeah. I, um, we did lose power. We lost water. Ugh. It was adventurous. Um, <laughs> I got did really you get out your snowsuit? Cold. Um, yes, exactly. I didn't. I didn't even have a winter coat here, actually. So in the years, anyway. um, I have a feeling that most of Texas was in that same boat. What yeah. is a winter coat, and what are what are boots? Like, exactly. what are those? What are those things? <laughs> <laughs> but my partner and I, we got very close to one another after <laughs> after days of no showering and me wearing right. clothes. So it was great. So I mean, it was nice that you were still in a place to uh, to even get close after a year of you know COVID and 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 pandemic life, lifestyle. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I just wanted to give you one more chance to, to really, to really dig in. Mm. So what have you, been, what have you been up to during, um, during the pandemic, during this time where theaters have been closed? What's been going on? Um, well, I mean, COVID is obviously devastating for yeah. personally and for the arts. Um, but in many ways I've been looking for the silver linings. So, um, as I said, I, I have spent, obviously a lot of time at home with my partner. Um, and to me, that is such a luxury because as a traveling freelance opera director, the majority of my life has been on the road for the last, you know, 20 years. Sure. So um, I've spent more time at home during this year than I have in my entire adult life. And that has felt wow. like a luxury. So yeah, I bet. <laughs> it's definitely, definitely a change of pace for sure. Yeah. Not packing up a suitcase every four every four weeks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> totally. Well, the reason we wanted to invite you on, Tara, was because you were the fabulous director for our uh, our well received um, Rigoletto back at, to kick off the 2019 2020 season. Yeah. Um, you know, we had a wonderful cast of uh, the Kong Wong was our our Duke and. Michael Chioldi, Austin's favorite baritone, um, was <laughs> Rigoletto. And Madison Leonard made her debut here as Gilda. Um, and so we had just such a wonderful cast. And to have you at the helm of this entire production, um, partnering with, with Robert Wood uh, uh, as the conductor, was just such a treat for all of us. So um, it's so great to see you. I'm, one, I'm excited to connect uh, over this opera again and to... Uh, to dive in a little bit. So um, <clears throat> let's go ahead and get started, yeah, shall we? Yes. So a little backstory on Rigoletto to start out with. Um, it premiered in 1851 at La Fenice in Venice. Um, the work has since become widely considered to be uh, the first of the masterpieces from Verdi's mid-career, um, his mid-writings. Um, and it's also become a, a, a staple in the in the operatic repertoire. It's it's consistently done. It's always in the top fifteen to twenty operas done every year. Um, so it's one of those that that you that you tend to see often, um, for sure. Um, so I just want to talk to you a little bit about your relationship with Rigoletto, um, your experience and your and your process for for what it is. So when Austin Opera approached you to direct this this piece, uh, what made you say yes? Like what was exciting to you about the project? What are some of the challenges that um, Rigoletto poses to a director? Well, honestly, the first uh, reason I was excited to take the job in Austin, um, what was on a much more personal level, <laughs> um, you know, as I said moments ago, um, I've lived in Houston since 2001, but most of my life has been on the road. So I was really excited to work in my home state and my boyfriend uh, lives in Austin. And um, and then 
moving more to the professional. I had had coffee with Annie Burridge very shortly after she came to Austin. And I was just so excited about the energy she was bringing to Austin Opera. And I really wanted to be a part of that. So I was delighted when she called and asked me to do Rigoletto, which, as you say, is a masterwork. And it's done so often, but with really good reason, um, because uh, it's amazing. <laughs> so that's great. I mean, I love, um, I love how it, it really marries like this traditional feeling, you know, Rigoletto, I'm sorry, Verdi, as you say, was moving out of into the middle period. And so it has still a traditional feel and lots of kind of set numbers, but it has a very modern sensibility that makes a lot of sense to us even today. You know, a morally bankrupt uh, executive leader <laughs> um, who infects, infects the entire court. There's this feeling of rotting from the head down. And, um, and also how it, this young girl is trapped in the system and, and how her father, the title character, uh, really pays, pays on a personal level for buying into that. So... I love yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, it's 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 really interesting to to kind of feel those themes just kind of repeat themselves as as society um, evolves and or doesn't evolve. Um, so it's interesting how how the themes of the of the piece for sure kind of bring us back and and just circle and circle and circle. Um, it's 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 super interesting. And so also, you know, the the musical language of of this piece is just so wonderful and rich. Um, moving into this period of Verdi's writing that it's a very, it's a markedly different style um, and um, depth to the, to the writing, especially in the orchestra yeah. um, that I just find so, so uh, thrilling. Yeah. And so it was really wonderful to, to be able to program this piece along with that season we did Rigoletto and Everest. And then obviously we were gonna to do Turandot before the uh, before everything closed down. And so we didn't get to that one, but that was uh, that was definitely the right way to kick off the season for sure. Um, are there any challenges in Rigoletto that um, as a director, like when you approach the score, was this your first time directing this piece? No, it wasn't. Okay, so you, so you had experience with this piece before. Now, as you came to the piece either for the first time or coming into this, this production, mm -hmm. were there anything, any moments in the opera that you're like, how am I going to solve this? Are there any um, challenges that that present themselves? Oh, sure. I mean, um, well, <laughs> every director who uh, has to do, not has to, gets to do Rigoletto, <laughs> has to do the scene. Um, there's a scene where they kidnap Gilda, but before that, there's a whole scene in an alley where Rigoletto <laughs> happens upon a bunch of courtiers and then they blindfold him and he doesn't realize that he's holding a ladder to kidnap <laughs> his own daughter at his own house. Um, <laughs> it's a challenge. The suspension of disbelief is, yeah. is high in that in that act. <laughs> yes, indeed. I mean, there's 25 <laughs> men singing at full voice and he's like, what's happening? Uh, anyway, uh, so that's fun. That is always a challenge. Um, Thank you for that bit, Verity. And hopefully <laughs> he, pays, um, he pays dividends for drama for the rest of the time. Um, there's also a little bit of a challenge with um, modern sensibilities about uh, believing that Gilda could fall so far in love with the Duke who is so clearly a jerk um, or reveals himself to be such a jerk. And how could she sacrifice herself for him? Spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> But, um, you know, that, so that's a lot of character work with the Gilda, and luckily we have a pretty amazing one, so that's nice. Yes, Matt, we were very, very lucky to, to land Madison Leonard, for sure, for sure. Yeah, um, I mean, honestly, the whole piece is fairly melodramatic, so it actually takes really good singing actors to provide the gravitas and weight it in naturalism um, that makes it work. Otherwise, yeah. it seems silly. Absolutely, um, absolutely. Yeah, if you go too far to like one direction of overplaying it too much or underplaying it too much, yeah. like there's that really, really specific sweet spot where I think it doesn't happen in every in every opera that you have to, you know, hone in so specifically on that on that line and carry it through the piece. It, it can be really, you know, it just wouldn't it wouldn't land either if you're on either side of that line. So and um, what you and the cast did with this production, I just thought 
threaded that needle very, very nicely. Um, very nice. Yes, of course. Uh, so Tara, you, you chose several clips for us to discuss today and to watch. Uh, so let's jump right in. The first clip is from the opera's prologue. Um, and you approach the prologue a little differently than other directors sometimes do. Um, do you want to talk to us about what that approach was and how, like what the inspiration for that was? Oh, sure. Well, you know, as you mentioned, Rigoletto is done thousands of times. <laughs> um, so there's kind of a, like, there's nothing new under the sun um, feeling about a lot of the classic rep. Um, and so in this spirit, I was really inspired by my work many, many years ago. I assisted a wonderful director named Lindy Hume, and um, she was brilliant. And I feel so lucky to have done this piece with her at the helm um, because she really informed the way I think about so much of the piece. And, and the prologue is one um, section of it. So this idea of kind of presenting a Renaissance painting um, uh, was really inspired by Lindy's work. Um, I, again, I was really interested in speaking from the moment you see people on stage about the idea um, that this is a beautiful, horrible world, um, that this like, idea of corruption from the head and a poisonous atmosphere and how the courtiers are complicit in what happens. Um, but that comes from a place of fear. Um, which is really heartbreaking. <laughs> uh, and so uh, we kind of meet the individual characters a little bit during the prologue. We see the Duke pull an innocent girl off stage and the courtiers do nothing but watch. And then at the very end, they turn to the audience as if to say, that's how it is here. This is who we are. But I also think what's important is they're saying, watch us at your own peril because we are also voyeurs. You know? Interesting, interesting, yeah. I feel like that reads really well. Why don't we, um, why don't we go ahead and, and watch this clip uh, from the prologue of Rigoletto? Wonderful. Oh, that's so great, Tara. That that just reads so well on stage. Thanks. Um, so moving along to our next clip, which features, as we mentioned, we had a, a luxury cast for this for this opera, and this features one of the most luxur luxurious members of that cast, uh, Madison Leonard singing Caro Nome. And Madison, the 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 hiring process for Madison was we heard her at the Met finals, um, the Met competition finals, singing Caro Nome. And immediately after that, we hired her for, for this role. So um, we were super excited to get her. Um, it was the second time that she had done the role. She had just done it in Seattle right before coming to us, I think like a month before. Yeah. Um, so she was fresh and she had some ideas that she brought to the table, but she was also really receptive, I know. And, and like you, Tara and Madison, I think you had worked together once before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, was that at Wolf Trap? 
I was or actually was trying else? to remember. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Anyway. But I know that you guys had a rapport already built, which was so, so helpful to kind of really flesh out this character. So um, why don't you talk about this scene? Talk about um, yours and Madison's process to get to what we what we saw as an audience. Sure. Well, I would say that any day you get to hear Madison sing Kara and Ame is a good day. <laughs> um, she's a, an exquisite singer, um, but she's also an exquisite actress. Um, and so working with her is a real pleasure. I'm so embarrassed that I can't remember where we worked together to begin with because I adore her. She's one of my favorites. And I, but I feel like I've known her forever. But um, anywho, so, uh, you know, Jilda is so often portrayed as just vacant, super innocent, life just happens to her and she has no agency or thoughts of her own. And I just take huge exception with that idea. And luckily Madison does too. <laughs> um, you know, Jilda is very assertive with her father, even from the very moment that she starts speaking with him. And she is a young girl. She is very innocent and doesn't have a lot of experience with life because she's been living in a convent for her whole life. Right, right. Um, and, you know, but she is, I think she has tons of agency. Obviously, she offers herself as a sacrifice in the last scene. But, um, you know, she's a young girl. She's full of a million hormones. And she's just met the most sexy, amazing singer. <laughs> <laughs> um, who said all the right things and just swept her off her feet. Um, so I think, you know, that's something most of us can really dig down and remember what it feels like. And that doesn't mean that we are stupid sheep. Right, <laughs> um, right. You know, it's very natural and wonderful. And so it was important to me that we really see like all the facets of what it means to be a teenager in love at this time. Um, and so in this moment, Jilda is reliving the, the meeting that she had with him, um, which in our show, uh, she falls off a bench when he sings <laughs> to her the first time and she's super embarrassed and like an awkward cult or something. So, so awkwardly cute. Yes, and <laughs> Madison plays that part beautifully. So um, in this section, which is the end of Karanome, um, I believe, uh, we see the complete range of emotion She's a silly young girl remembering falling off that bench. Um, she's a teen with not so innocent longings. And also we see a glimpse of the determined and mature woman that is imagining like a life with children and all these things. And I, I, I think that Madison shows that every moment of it while singing like a goddess. The, the, um, the amount of um, vocal acrobatics that she does while, you know, rolling around on the floor, laying flat on her back, you know, like the amount of uh, control that she has of her, of her vocal mechanism is just, is unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And the control that she has between dynamics and breath support. And I mean, it's a masterclass. It really truly is. Um, so without further ado, let's, let's take a look at, at Karan Ome. Oh. 
All right. Well, after that clip, it would be hard to follow, but you know, we we leave it at the feet of Austin's favorite baritone, Michael Chioldi, uh, and we arrive at the aria Cortigiani. Um, Tara, tell us about this moment in the opera and why you wanted to share it today. Well, um, this is one of the best sections of music, I would say, in the entire repertory. Um, I'm sorry I keep saying that. This is my favorite part. <laughs> <laughs> this is a lot of great music. Sorry. It's nice that you that you enjoyed the, the piece you were directing. That's that's important for us <laughs> to know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so I picked this section because um, from a technical perspective, it's um, it's interesting when you're dealing with a large stage. I'm constantly thinking in terms of variety and um, use of space and use of emotion and feeling. And so in this section, we go from kind of a wide shot, realistic feeling. The chorus is doing a lot of non-singing vocalism, um, which I really love because I think that brings the people in like, not everybody can sing high C, but everybody laughs out loud at some point. You know what I mean? So they right. sort of feel like they can be there too. Um, so anyway, we go from that wide shot natural feeling to a much more stylized close up kind of feeling. Um, and I actually literally bring the chorus in around Rigoletto to form almost a spotlight, a human spotlight around him. Yeah, like um, a human view box. It was almost like it just brought everybody in. Yeah, exactly. I mean, hopefully that's the dream. <laughs> that's the dream. <laughs> so yeah, so and it, it brings all the attention on Rigoletto. And so dramatically, I love this moment. Um, this is such a heartbreaking moment in the show to me. The courtiers have kidnapped Gilda and they, um, and Rigoletto has been frantically looking for her all night long and come to the Duke's palace fearing the worst. And so they've actually been toying with him, like, what are you looking for? And he's looking around the room. And they're like, oh, I don't know. I was asleep all night. They're really pulling his chain the whole time. And this is the moment where he finally snaps and realizes that Gilda is here and she is in the with the Duke in his bedroom right this second. And there's nothing that he can do about it. So he <laughs> kind of has a mental break and he just screams at them, telling him exactly what he thinks of them. And then there's some violence and he breaks down and just becomes the most heartbroken, sobbing father. Um, so it's a pretty powerful moment. Well done, Verity. <laughs> right, exactly. And when you pair that with a voice like Michael's, um, who sings with such passion and such um, like such depth, um, I, I once uh, referred to him as like, he he was doing a Tosca with me and I referred to sitting in the, in the dressing, uh, the dress rehearsal of, I felt like I was getting hit in the chest with a cannonball every time he sang, yeah. like in the best way possible. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so you know, having Michael in this role is was another luxury that we had. So let's go ahead and, and listen and watch Cortigiani. Well, there was Michael, and now we're going to go into the final act of the opera, 
we have one of the most recognized quartets in, in the operatic repertoire. Um, it's done frequently by, it, it, what's funny is it's often done by uh, young artist programs because it has one of every voice. Like, so it's like, oh, this is one that everyone can sing together, even if they shouldn't. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's, it's, super, it's super recognizable um, and kind of one of those staples that, that you hear um, over and over and over again. But Tara, tell us uh, about this scene we also we haven't touched much yet on the on the set for this opera, but it was it was from New Orleans Opera, um, and scenically it did a really nice job of finding the moments where it could split the stage. You mentioned earlier in our in our discussion about um, scene two of Act One where they're in the alleyway, but then you have the house, and so on stage you actually have these two worlds that are that are outlined, and then in this act in Act Three um, you also have the the garret or the the uh, the tavern and then you have outside the tavern and those are two very different worlds and so um, do you want to tell us about the scene and 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 help set us up and how the set helped to inform the the staging oh sure I mean it's really difficult to talk about Rigoletto and not include this quartet honestly exactly exactly. Um, I think, um, you know, again, Verdi's masterful showing us four completely different perspectives at the same time. They're all singing quite different vocal lines, but they mesh amazingly. So um, we have the Duke who is seducing Madalena um, in a very different way than he seduced Gilda, which is kind of a slap in the face. Um, he knows his audience, so to speak. Um, Madalena is playfully flirting with him um, while kind of manipulating him to get what she wants out of the relationship. Um, Gilda is seeing the Duke's betrayal for the first time. Um, she's destroyed by what she's seeing. And Rigoletto is pretty much telling Gilda not to waste her tears on him, but that he's gonna take care of the situation. Um, yeah, and so uh, it's a fun challenge. Um, but as you say, <laughs> so this is a tavern. It's like a hole in the wall on the outskirts of town. So it's usually decrepit, murky. There's a little river running by. And um, and then this disgusting tavern where Sparfagile hangs out with his sister, Madalena. Um, yeah, so uh, there's this whole indoor-outdoor feeling and that they can see in a window um, and to see what's going on. Um, the trick, I think, in this uh, section is there are two verses and then a kind of extended coda in the music. And the trick is to keep the Duke and Madalena from mauling each other. <laughs> um, because it's the most sexy music. And, um, you know, if, if, if this was naturalism, they would just be naked by the end. Right. Um, <laughs> Not that yeah. kind of show. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I've seen some shows where it's almost that, but um, I usually keep things a little bit more PG. Um, but you want to still have that feeling. And um, so to keep them apart, um, and but not make it just seem like they're just running around the table constantly. And also to keep a sexy story building. I mean, that's harder than you might imagine, actually. Um, it's actually really athletic singing for all four of them throughout. Um, it, it requires singers at the top of their game. But the Duke and Madalena have a lot, a big acting job um, mm -hmm. to keep it sexy, keep it playful, keep it fun, sing the heck out of it and still continue to tell the story. Um, but I have to say, you know, it's it's a really satisfying moment in all of operatic history. So. For sure. Well, let's dig right into the uh, into that moment, shall we?
Scudi hai tu detto, ecco nei dieci, e dopo lo fra il resto. E qui rimane, sì, alla mezzanotte ritornerò. Non pare, a gettarmi lo fiume basto io solo. No, no, il vuol fare io stesso. Sì, ah, il suo nome. Our last clip of the day is um, the trio and the storm section in, in Act 3, and it features Allegra De Vita as Madalena, Madison as Gilda, and Peter Volpe as Sparafu Chile. Um, also, again, it's one of those super satisfying moments um, where you know what's going to happen, but you just can't look away. <laughs> it's yeah. like, ah, don't, don't, just don't. Yeah. Um, so talk to us about this scene and what made you select this for our viewers. Well, I really thought we should end on a high note, but I thought one of the highest notes in the show. <laughs> um, yeah, so again, this is amazing music and um, really fun lighting and all the things. Um, dramatically, uh, Rigoletto has paid Sparafuccile to kill the Duke, but Madalena loves him and um, she wants to keep him alive. So they make an agreement that if anyone happens to show up at the tavern before midnight, then they'll kill that person. One and of those classic opera agreements. <laughs> yes, exactly. Also, <laughs> Gilda happens to be dressed like a boy outside listening. Um, so she realizes that she has only one choice. She's gonna have to sacrifice herself. So um, we're gonna listen to the last section of the trio uh, which is some of the most aggressive singing in the show. Again, it's three people singing their guts out. Um, it just drives and amazing. drives and drives. Yeah. Yeah. The orchestra is amazing. Um, the lighting is amazing. It's a crazy storm, as you said. And also the men's chorus is singing along. They sing the wind. So there are like all these amazing elements just flying in your face. And it ends with a big high C, I think. I think it's a C. Um, it's a thrilling moment. Leave it at that. Well, here we go. Thank you. 
Tara, thank you so much for revisiting your directorial debut with, with Austin Opera um, mm -hmm. and for catching up with me. It's so great to, to catch up. Do you have any lasting memories that you've taken with you from the experience here in Austin, um, either as, the, as a director into future productions that you, that you will do or just as, at your time here with Austin Opera? I mean, honestly, um, our world is so strange in the opera business. And anytime I have the chance to you know, catch up with old friends, um, which there were many in this cast actually, and, and in the technical crew as well. Um, and then also obviously making new friends um, was super great. Um, making, um, connecting with an old opera score that I adore. Um, but honestly, it was just being in Austin and um, getting to know the chorus and getting to know the city in a different way, meeting your lovely patrons and um, sleeping in my own bed at the end of the night. <laughs> <It was laughs> that, you can't put a price on that. <laughs> yeah, <it was> really <laughs> Austin, not too shabby. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent, mm -hmm. excellent. Well, Tara, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, you know, it was so wonderful working with you those months and months ago. Um, mm -hmm. And I really hope that we're able to do it again in the, in the very near future. Yeah. Um, and uh, for all of you viewers out there, uh, please check out our premium winter pass, Rigoletto, uh, the entire uh, uh, video of Rigoletto from our 2019 production is available. Uh, you can find out more details at www.austinopera.org. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Tara, for joining us. We hope everyone has a great weekend. Thank you. Bye.